In 1971, a Kansas farm boy named John Riggins arrived in New York and made an immediate impression. The first thing we, we kind of noticed about John was that he was able to grow uh, an afro. Here's this guy coming out of Kansas, a white guy. So all of a sudden, I mean, he's a soul brother and guys are kind of playing with him in a little different light. Riggins had the look. The question was, did he have the game? Were you very confident that you were going to make it in the NFL? I was kind of ignorant of the NFL. So I didn't know of all the first round draft choices over the years who'd made it and hadn't made it. I remember Bob Ferguson, the big fullback from Ohio State, was a guy that didn't quite catch on. I'm figuring, you know, I'm going to be a Bob Ferguson. At 6'2 and 230 pounds, Riggins was bigger and better than Bob Ferguson. Riggins was a high school sprint champion who broke Gale Sayers' career rushing record at the University of Kansas. And he didn't slow down when he came to the NFL. Could you complete this sentence for me? The mark of a great running back is his eyes. It's his eyes. If you can't see the, the cracks, if you can't find daylight, it's hopeless. Forget about it. Starts right there with your eyes. Maybe along that line is the instinct. I think to me it's a very physical game. I, you know, I grew up on a farm and we used to get cattle, you know. You know, the cattle will always stay away from you, you know, they're very passive and but you know you get one in a corner and you got a problem. Invariably a defense would put me in a corner. That's when they had a problem. Most great players agree football is a head game, and no running back used his head as creatively as John Riggins. It certainly drew attention, but it, but it also made a statement about me, which is, you know, I don't know if I want to mess with that guy. You know, the last guy you ever want to pick on is a crazy guy. I mean, you know, the tough guy, you got a shot, because you think he'll think logically. The crazy guy don't know what he's going to do. John, when did you first realize that this was a business? It wasn't really my rookie year, because I think I was still starstruck. I think it was actually my second year. And I think Weeb, actually, the general manager, sent me a bonus check for $1,000. If I'm not mistaken, my second year I had 944 yards, but I missed basically four games. And so he said, you know, it would have been more had you made 1,000 yards. And I thought, really? That was kind of when I started to realize that it wasn't quite exactly what the ancient Greeks had in mind when they invented the Olympics. I viewed the game through the wide, starry eyes of a youth when I first came into it. In reality, that's just not the way it is, my friends. This is a business. And the only thing that really makes it a game is the competition that burns in the athletes that play on Sunday afternoon. Riggins was the first back in Jets history to rush for more than a thousand yards in a season. But after five years of losing, he was so frustrated that his competitive fire was reduced to a mere flicker. When you were playing with the Jets, you were quoted your last year that was you were half-hearted. You said the quote was that you were like a machine at half throttle. That must have been a bad feeling for you. I mean, being the competitor that you are and looking at your whole career to feel, to think to yourself that I'm only going half speed here. Is that why you left the Jets? Yeah. I, I mean, uh, well, there was another reason. It was Joe Namath. John Riggins' talent was really never going to be explored, I didn't feel, as long as Joe was the quarterback, because it was going to be a passing team. And Joe called his own plays back then. I got an ego, and you know, I got a little bit of pride, and so I thought, well, I wouldn't mind having the team geared towards me. I think I have that kind of talent. But I also know, this is Joe Namath. They wanted parity. They wanted parity with Namath. And uh, if he didn't get parity with Namath, he was willing to take his trade someplace else. John was one of the first free agents, and George really went after him to get him. But once he got him, he used him as a blocking back, you know. One time, John went to George and said, hey, George, why don't you just put a 60 number on me? You get the ball four or five. Sometimes you only get it a couple times a game. I think George wanted a little quicker scat back. He was not quite sure what was going through Riggins' mind. I don't think he trusted him. Riggins was unhappy playing for George Allen, 
and things only got worse when Jack Pardee took over as head coach two years later. So, in July 1980, Riggins made a stunning announcement. He was quitting pro football at age 30. I have resigned my position of fullback, effective 1 o'clock p.m. Sunday, July 27, 1980. Happy trails to you until we meet again, signed John Riggins. John didn't have agendas. It was tough to resent John Riggins. It wasn't like now, where Ricky Williams leaves a team in the lurch and you hear teammates saying, I don't ever want him back. To hell with him. That wasn't the case with John. And there was a certain, as usual about John, honorable defiance. John said, I don't want to be under thumb. I want to do whatever I want to do. There was a little bit of retribution in my walking away. In the nine years that I'd played, I saw a lot of hearts broken. You have friends, and next thing you know, during training camp, the knock comes, and they're no longer on a team. And that was hard for me. I mean, over the years, I'd kind of just, this resentment had grown and grown. I kind of went, all right, now you guys are going to know what it's like to feel rejection. Now, it's your deal without me. Figure it out. In 1981, new Redskins coach Joe Gibbs visited John Riggins in Kansas, hoping to convince him to come back. And so he just shows up unannounced. I was kind of like, well, hey, at least you can do is call. You just don't show up and say, hey, Joe Gibbs, hey, new coach. The very first time I meet him, he's coming across the back of the courtyard with a hunting outfit on. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. He's got a beer can in his right hand. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of going, no, great. I got a beer in each hand, one for him, one for me. Joe goes, nah. I went, well, a little early in the morning. He said, ah, oh, I just, and I went, well, okay. He said, I'll drink them, which I did. Ten minutes into this thing, he finally leans across the table on the first meaningful thing he said to me. He looks across that table and he goes, you need to get me back there. I'll make you famous. <laughs> and I, 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 all of a sudden I go, oh my gosh. The guy's a fruitcake. I'm going to get stuck coaching a fruitcake for 10 years. His teammates gave Riggins a royal reception. But he explained his return with typical irreverence. Hey, I'm bored, I'm broke, and I'm back. He had tremendous football arrogance. And I can remember numerous times walking in RFK Stadium and said, you just come over here. He said, about 57,000 in the crowd today. I said, yeah, Johnny. He said, they all came to see me. So make sure Gibbsy gets the message. I want the ball. I said, you got it. <laughs> Gibbs made Riggins the centerpiece of his offense. And he responded by becoming the only back to rush for more yards in his 30s than in his 20s aided in part by a pregame ritual. We would never take the field until John got his vitamin B shot in the rear end. We heard, ah! That was John Riggins getting his vitamin B. We said, we're ready to go. <laughs> so those are the things. And I asked the doctor, I said, what actually is a vitamin B shot? He said, oh, we fill that thing with water and just <laughs> give him a jab. He thinks he's Superman after that. But beneath the tattered cape was not a superhero, but an anti-hero. I was a hedonist, you know, take it or leave it, you know, kind of a pagan hedonist. I don't know about my diet, but let's face it, I didn't get a lot of sleep. I lived for the moment, and I lived to enjoy myself. And I never thought of myself as really have putting in much time. I felt like I'd try, but I knew in my heart that I didn't quite see it through. You know, I was lazy. Yeah, but in a way, I don't know whether that's true, because to me... I know, uh, I've heard a lot uh, of people uh, say, no, no. That, you're, that you're a little bit of a sandbagger in this, because I remember go into Redskin practices and the team would come off the field and it would be twilight and you'd be down there all by yourself running sprints. So to me some of this is a little bull You're trying to let people know that well look I'm the natural I'm not working but in your heart there, there really was that you really were committed you really well, did work. He would come in at four five o'clock in the morning and get the weights done where nobody would saw, see him. He'd go in a training room late at night or early in the morning so nobody can see him get it treated in there so he was kind of a sly fox about that. One time John wanted to go uh, duck hunting in Baltimore so he had to be in a duck blind before the sun came up he said by 4.30, so we asked if we could work out at 2.30 in the morning. And people look at running backs, you know, like spring flowers. They, they bloom quickly, brightly, yeah. and then they're gone. Here's a, I don't know what uh, kind of species you were, that you could come in at 32, 33 and, and take the beating that you did. You didn't seem to lose any speed. Well, I've never doubted my talent. Hi. I mean, seriously, I mean, my talent was, in all honesty, and I, 
I mean, I, what am I going to do? Go, oh, shucks, you, you accused me of sandbagging a little while ago. The truth of the matter was, there's probably only a handful of backs that had my talent. Big Jim's the one that comes to mind right away because physically, we're so similar. And like the great Jim Brown, Riggins was held in awe by his teammates, even on the practice field. We run plays we call live thud, really getting into people, giving them good hard chuck. They would not even touch him. It was the most unique thing I've ever seen. They would not even touch John Riggins in practice. That's the ultimate respect because they knew that guy could load the wagon and pull it himself. Riggins was the Redskins leader on the field. He was also their leader off the field and after hours. The five o'clock club, club basically was the hogs getting together after practice for a beer or two in a little shack that was out there where they kept the equipment. And it was just offensive linemen. But, as it would be, John Riggins was in the club. He called himself the El Presidente. He was the president of the Five O'Clock Club. What did the Gibbs think about that? Well, I'm sure it was one of those things that caused him a little bit of consternation. I said, we got a problem there. I said, the Five O'Clock Club. I said, you got to fix this for me. And he goes like this, done. Don't worry about it. Done. I got this covered for you. You know, one of those things. And so he goes walking off, and I went, hey, that was easy. You know, I figured that was going to be a fight. And the bottom line is, I think he moved it 100 yards <laughs> right outside the fence. Riggins moved the 5 o'clock club, and in 1982, he put the entire team on his back and carried it through the postseason. Appreciate that I'd never really been in a meaningful playoff game in what would have been 10 years in the NFL. Thinking the Super Bowl is what it's all about. Even though I know it's a business, this has got to be like the promised land if there is one in the NFL. So I'm driving into Redskin Park. I was starting to think of the possibilities to how the great this was going to be. I'm telling you, Steve, I'm driving down the road and I'm getting goosebumps. In fact, I'm getting them now telling the story. I mean, the hair was starting to stand up on the back of my neck. So I roll in there, I see Joe Bugle by the water fountain. I say, Bugs, give me the ball. That's all I'm going to say. Just give me the ball, everything's going to be all right. Actually, it was one of those deals where you had a chance to step forward and basically shape your destiny. And I'll always feel like that was my moment. This was John Wayne. I mean, this was a movie. He's running down the sidelines, and he lowers his shoulder on a DB, and he must have knocked this guy five yards back out of bounds. Okay, and you could sense right there that, 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 that you know, he had something to him that day. There's certain people that have the ability to be on a stage in sports, and they raise it up a level, and John had the ability to do that. Gibbs gave Riggins the ball 62 times against Detroit and Minnesota and he pounded out 304 yards in the two victories. Not everybody has an opportunity to see a, a Hall of Famer execute at his highest level, and I think that's what we saw in that stretch. He knew that these guys were counting on him, and, uh, and he relished the fact that they did. This is what he thrived on. This was his stage. In the NFC Championship game, Riggins carried the ball 36 times and battered the Dallas defense for 140 yards and two touchdowns. For John Riggins, the athlete, maybe for John Riggins, the man, that's my favorite story of all of it. I mean, beating Dallas to go to the Super Bowl, that was a very defining moment, knowing that we were going. When you won the Super Bowl, it was more of a numbing, stunning moment. There's the snap, hand to Riggins, good hold. picked one play in Redskin history. It's the one play I got on my wall. John signed it for me. I was fortunate enough. At least I think it's his signature. It better be. It was the signature play for Riggins, who set a Super Bowl record with 38 carries for 166 yards. You said something earlier I want to get back to about the Super Bowl. You used an interesting word, numbing. It was emotionally numbing. I was by far the last guy to leave that day. Stands are completely empty, you got all the cups and you got a few of the workers that are pushing the brooms and cleaning the place out. And I look up and I see the scoreboard and it says Redskins 27, Dolphins 17. And in that moment, I went, I'm a world champion. As Super Bowl MVP, John Riggins was the toast of Washington. 
and it was during a night of toasting that he met Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. So I get there and I have a couple double scotches right off the bat. So, okay, now I'm kind of, you know, and I haven't had eaten anything all day. So I sit down and start drinking wine. Well, now they bring me dinner and by this point I'm like, yeah, no, I don't want nothing to eat. No. <laughs> Justice O'Connor had indicated early on that, she, you know, she was going to have to leave. She couldn't stay for the whole party. And, and I think that she was getting ready to go. You know, basically, it was said in the sense as you would somebody that was your house and you're having fun and you're assuming they're having fun. You go, hey, Sandy, baby, loosen up, you know, Sandy, baby. You know, it's like, stick around. Come on, we'll have some more fun or whatever. Then I got up to go over to talk to her, her husband, John. All I know, you know, like an 18 wheeler on the in interstate, I jackknife somewhere <laughs> over behind his chair. And I guess he was sitting with Mrs. John Glenn and, you know, she couldn't get out of her chair because this 18-wheeler with jackknife there. So that's the story that I recall. Because he was different, because he was colorful, he never fit the convention of Washington. And that's difficult because here is the most ridiculously conventional place in America. And people don't like folks who color outside the lines. And Riggins lived outside the lines. And yet, because it was natural and it was truly who he was and it wasn't an act, People loved him. They also loved Riggins for what he did between the lines. In 83, he set a league record with 24 touchdowns. He was coughing up blood in the NFC title game, but he still scored twice to beat the 49ers. But the toll of 14 seasons finally caught up with Riggins, and he was released in 1986. After you retired, you lived in a trailer? Yeah, I was cheapo and kind of like, you know, solitary man, you know. But let's face it, I've had an unusual point of view for a better part of my life. So what did you do all day? I mean, what, well, you know, well, you know, because we hear these I was on the river. I was on the Potomac River, which, you know, so I fished. But, you know, I'm kind of one of those guys that just, I daydream a lot, you know. I just think about stuff. There was a quote about your life after football, and it said, John Riggins acts like one of the Apollo astronauts who walked on the moon. They've discovered they can't cope with everyday life, and coming back down to Earth was unbearably boring. Fundamentally, that's probably got some truth to it, because the one thing about football is fantasy, but there's something very addictive about it, and that is, you know, 50, 60, 75, 80,000 fans giving you this adulation. Once you've experienced that, that's, that's getting right up there. It's almost like pure oxygen or whatever you want to call it. And that's hard to get, that's hard to get away from. When you got in the ring of honor for the Redskins, the U and Theismann were inducted. And one of the great moments that any fan in Washington will say is when you came out in your uniform. Why did you decide to do that? Well, I have a a showman flair to me, and I knew that that would be a great moment, that I would really enjoy it. It's like I told Joe out there when I got there, I had to hear it one more time. I've tried to get back in, you know, in the acting to recreate that, to have that same amount of success in something else. Riggins now lives in New York, where he has performed on stage and in daytime TV. What movies bring you to tears? It's always the courage that people show. The willingness to take a chance or the willingness to risk and then to succeed. I'll tell you what, Robert Service, he's the poet that wrote a lot about Alaska. But he also wrote The Law of the Yukon, which I recited from at, at my induction ceremony. Well, there's that one part in there. He says, Men with the hearts of Vikings and the simple faith of a child. Men with the hearts of Vikings and the simple faith of a child of a child. That works for me. John Riggins had a great run, starring as the Redskins' indomitable fullback. But whatever stage he appears on, he is sure to be the leading man. Absolutely fits John's personality, I think, to be there expressing himself as a character. It'd be great if they let him be John Riggins. I think that's the, probably the, the best character he could ever be. And in closing, I want to leave a little something with you. Remember, the news of my craziness has been greatly exaggerated. What fouls the eye in the perception is that I am the horse of a different color. 
was reading Newsweek magazine, and they have a little thing which says that, you know, new things that are coming up. And apparently, they've developed this video-equipped tombstone that will display a message from the grave's occupant. If you were to purchase that, what message would you like to see? I suppose he came to play. And you can take that as broadly or as narrowly as you want. But that's what life is to me. I came to play.